Oh, not that guy again. Can't we do one on James Ray? Davis had one of the longest, most productive, diverse and controversial careers in all of the classic canon. He also had one of the most remarkably consistent and thoroughly excellent catalogues of any artist. Which makes the exercise of ranking those albums from least essential to most essential especially difficult. A few rules and exceptions before we commence. No live albums, no compilations, no soundtracks, no albums put together from old sessions. And the recordings included for ranking are all of the studio albums from his Columbia and Warner Brothers years, as well as some selections from his prestige years, chiefly those post-1954 when music making ceased to be an excuse to make quick money for heroin. So, now that we know what we've let ourselves in for, let's dive in. We begin with number 34, you're Under Arrest from 1985, which veers between the tediously bland and the aggressively annoying. It's one of the worst album covers of all time as well. Number 33 is Quiet Nights from 1962, an unfinished collaboration with Gil Evans rushed out by the studio. It wouldn't have been that good even if it had not been finished. Number 32 is The Man with the Horn from 1980, Miles' big comeback plays it a bit too safe artsy-wise, but was on the right target sales-wise. 31 is Decoy, 1984's effort at more 80s-style tedium. It stretches a little bit further, but the band just doesn't want to seem to jump up to it. Number 30 sees Live Evil from 1971, an overwrought set of brutal funk. There are some very good songs indeed, but there's an awful lot of turgid sameness to plough through. Nefertiti takes number 29. From 1968, it's the final of the Tony Williams-led hard bop trilogy. It relies less on songs and more on textures, which some people may very easily prefer. 1986's Tutu comes in at number 28. An attempt to do a new In a Silent Way, maybe. The title track itself is a masterpiece. Number 27 is Cookin' from 1956. The lesser of four albums which Miles and his classic quintet cut in two sessions to record their prestige records contract. That said, My Funny Valentine is one of his handful, and we're talking top five, top three, best performances ever. Number 26 comes to 1992 with Doobop, where Miles flirts with hip hop. It's no great shakes as a statement, but it is as entertaining as heck. Seven Steps to Heaven from 1963 is number 25. A transitional album where Tony Williams, Ron Carter and Herbie Hancock came into the band. Basin Street Blues and I Fall in Love Too Easily are indispensable. Number 24 is Amandala from 1989. Very solid late period miles. The band is cracking and he's in lively spirits. Hannibal is a strong keeper. Number 23, Miles in the Sky from 1968. His best album cover, one of his most difficult albums. Electrical instruments make their first appearance. This is dense and mysterious music. Star People from 1983 comes in at number 22. Up tempo, upbeat, with Miles finally finding a bit of form after his long layoff. There's very little sax here, just mainly Miles and the guitars. You and I is as catchy as all get out. Number 21 sees us travel to 1956 and Workin', another of the prestige releases. There are three songs that you shouldn't have to live without on this. Four, Half Nelson, and It Never Entered My Mind. Number 20, we travel to 1967 for Sorcerer. The album is intended as a transition between Miles Smiles' song-based bop and the more atmospheric Nefertiti. Herbie Hancock's title track or the prickly Masquilero highlight. Number 19, Someday My Prince Will Come from 1961. 
The only album in this catalogue where Miles doesn't have a clear conceptual ambition. Someday atones for this with some of Miles' most lyrical and expressive playing on wax. Old folks, drag dog, Francing, and I thought about you make a powerful case for this album. Number 18, Round About Midnight, 1957. Miles' Columbia debut, this is an odd, slightly unscented album that defies easy classification. But take off your jazz hat and put on your fan ears, and Round Midnight, Elucha, and Bye Bye Blackbird are delights for the ages. 17. Is 1969's Feed to Kilimanjaro. Side one is difficult going in places, but side two is music of such majesty, such grace, that all is forgiven. Back to 1956 in the Prestige Studios again in Hackensack for number 16, which was relaxing with the Miles Davis Quintet. A great album cover, greater music. There's nothing on this which isn't fresh, enjoyable, and pretty straightforwardly tuneful. Number 15, Milestones from 1958. Another great album cover, and what a great album. Not for beginners, or for the faint of heart. This is a wild, thrilling, high-octane, high-speed chase through the blues. Utterly deranged and magnificent for every second of its runtime. 14, 1965's ESP. Milestones are somewhat grown-up cousin. ESP is the same principles but with a lot more improvisational approach. Writing credits are shared here as they never were before and the diverse range of input provides a perfectly varied framework. But if I'm pressed, RJ, Agitation and Herbie Hancock's Little One shine out brightest. Number 13, the perennially difficult On The Corner from 1972. As discussed in TRB 11, an album of equal greatness and madness, frequently coming within bars of one another. Always divisive and always hard to assess holistically. It belongs either here but no higher, or as some distant, inexplicable outlier to the catalogue. Number 12, Steeman from 1956, a strong, solid prestige outing. Given all the material for the four albums listed here was recorded on two days, there's little difference in band performance, just different responses to the selection. This album, veering as it does from sunny show tunes to warm love songs and bebop classics, essays everything almost playfully. The bop classics Salt Peanuts and Well You Needn't ought to be in anybody's collection. Number 11, Bags Groove, 1954, a bit of an all-star session with Milt Jackson, Sonny Rollins, Thelonious Monk and Clute Clark amongst others. The core of this album are three of the most outstanding pieces in all of jazz, Olio, Erigen, which is Nigeria spelled backwards, and Doxy. Throw in a charming reading of Gershwin's But Not For Me and the hyper cool title track and you have a package which you could show to a man from Mars to explain what jazz is. Into the top 10 and we go across 1970's Bitches Brew, the album which blew the doors off jazz and took it across into the rock mainstream. Bitches Brew has lost a little of its luster in the years going by. Album 2 is stunning with Spanish Key, Miles Runs the Voodoo Down and Sanctuary, all brilliant, brilliant pieces. But Album 1 just seems to be a mass of music without a clear direction, so it loses a spot or two for that. Number 9, Miles Ahead from 1957. Miles' pop album. The 19-piece band is a charming throwback. The song selection is impeccable. Miles playing on flugelhorn, no less, is immaculate. And as a whole, Gil Evans' arrangements are great. Just now and then they become a little intrusive in trying to push or emphasise passages, but songs like Springsville, My Ship, Blues for Pablo and the title track are enough to forgive sins far more egregious. 1986 next for number 8, The Mysterious Aura. The second to last album issued in Davis's lifetime, Aura is mesmerising, breathtaking, life-affirming music. Danish composer Pali Mikkelborg originally wrote The Suite as a tribute to Davis, but Columbia, when coming to release it, recognised its quality and put Davis and Mikkelborg together so that Davis might solo over The Suite. The two men come together to create something so simple out of such conceptual complexity as seems miraculous. It's the best work Davis had done in 16 years and some of the very, very best he ever did. Number 7, The Birth of the Cool from 1949. 
Both of the coolers Miles's and a few others reaction to the increasing complexity and tired soundingness of bebop with music that was intimate, unhurried and relied on interplay and voicing more than brutal technical precision. The songs are tuneful and nimble and the playing, especially Davis's, is first class and the spirit is revolutionary. This is the first of the three major changes in the course of jazz history that Davis was responsible for. Perhaps the least heralded, but just as important as the others. Number six, Sketches of Spain from 1960. As artifacts of the maturation of popular taste in the 20th century goes, this would be one of the essential ones. Centered around the Concerto di Aranjuez, which a lot of people think is a classical piece but was in fact written in 1939, Davis and Gil Evans build a suite of songs which are by turn wistful, longing, passionate and dramatic. Whether taken as music for relaxation and mood setting or as active engaged listening, this is Vital Miles Davis, a vital record for any half serious collector. Number five, a tribute to Jack Johnson, 1970. Another one I'm not sure should be here. Technically it's a soundtrack album, but I'm not sure whether it was an album then a soundtrack or vice versa. Plus it's so damn good it gets a pass. This is Miles' rock album. Michael Henderson, John McLaughlin and Billy Cobham provide the perfect rhythm section on side A, while they, plus Jack Dijonet, Chick Corea and the busy scissors of Teo Massaro make a web of electronica on side two. Thrilling, danceable, then hypnotic and gripping. This is where Miles came closest to the then mainstream. Number four, 1959's Kind of Blue. It's a poor cliche to say that Kind of Blue is the jazz album that even people who don't like jazz like. From the hipster swing of Freddie Freeloader to the menace of Coltrane on all blues, to the diaphanous blue and green, the tender flamenco sketches, and Miles' best ever solo on So What? Kind of Blue is like an old friend and one that is never far away when you need it. Number three, In a Silent Way from 1969. Surely this is one record of all of Miles' record whose reputation truly precedes it. It's driven by its dichotomy. While the top of the music seems unstructured and swirling, Tony Williams playing somewhat against type anchors the music and keeps it propulsive and purposeful. This was Williams' last recording with Miles and from the moment he breaks his shackles at the end of the title segment and goes out in the long fade blazing away, raging against the dying of the light. It is for me one of the emotional high points of Miles' catalogue. Number two is Miles Smiles from 1967, in which Miles, while forging ahead with his hard bop style and pushing Tony Williams to the forefront of the band, took a glance backwards to a more structured song style here and manages to make the connection between the cerebral and the visceral elegantly and rewardingly. Herbie Hancock's solo on Circle is a thing of wonder for all of the ages. And number one, Number one is Porgy and Bess from 1959. Not only my favourite Miles Davis album, but my favourite album by anyone of all time. His playing here is at his high point, especially on My Man Is Gone and Bess You Is My Woman Now. Gil Evans' arrangements and conducting of the band are astonishing, and the collection of tiny details contributed by the supporting musicians, including his usual associates Adelaide Chambers and Cobb, are incredible. There's so much more to this album. Social facets, racial consciousness, Davis's singular personality and his unique ability to infuriate both the white and black establishments. Just look at the album cover. It's legitimization of the black artistic experience as affirmation or culture and not mere entertainment. But while it's playing, that's nothing. There's just the world within that record. It's the greatest and most precious record album that I've ever come across. Good morning, my Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. What would pique my curiosity is your response to the list that's just been presented and the degree to which you agree or disagree with the placements on it. So while you're contemplating that and formulating a response, grab a plate of biscuits and a cool beverage.
enjoy the playlist with some of the finest selections from Miles's catalogue on it. And until we meet again in good fellowship, or the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff, and you stay righteous. Concerto di Hand Concerto di Aranjuez Concerto di Hawan Concerto di Aranjuez Concerto di Hand